Logo Centrifugal Podcast. I am Chance Lunsford, and I'm also I'm also Logo Centrifugal. Sometimes I stumble on my words. You can figure out all of that. I'm here today with my special guest, Brendan Murata. Now, Brendan's a person who I was introduced to from a previous guest on this podcast, John Jufre, and I was instantly intrigued because. John pitched me the idea of having a conversation with you, Brendan, because of your um, upcoming film, American Circumcision. And interestingly enough, this is a issue that I've had some interest in for some time. Um, and just the opportunity to actually talk about somebody who had spent a lot of time thinking about it and talking to other people seemed like um, a great opportunity. And I, I did a little checking into you uh, nothing stalker like or anything but i visited your website and i i saw that you've done a number of other films and they all sounded pretty interesting and so uh i'm looking forward to this conversation and with that welcome to the logo centrifugal podcast and why don't you tell the people a little bit about who you are and what you do sure thanks for having me on uh like like you said my name is brennan Murata, and i did a feature length documentary called American Circumcision, which explores the modern debate around circumcision and the growing movement that says that men should be able to make their own choices about their bodies. So the film was shot over six years and includes interviews with top experts on both sides. And it, we toured in multiple cities across the country and you, you can now watch it everywhere that you watch movies. So Amazon, iTunes, Vimeo, and it's now on Netflix. Uh, and there's a, a million directions we could go talking about this issue. So I'll let you take it from there. Okay. Um, well, one thing I'm immediately curious about is this is kind of an interesting subject to approach an expert and say, I'm making a film about circumcision. I wonder, did you get any balking or kind of strange looks when you first started this project? Um, or how did that go? Um, that's an interesting question. It depends who you talk to. So I think the initial reaction from some friends and family was like, why would you want to make a film about that? And if you know anything about the issue, it's infinitely interesting. But part of the challenge is that the way that it's framed in culture is it's sort of represented as a one-time decision that parents make and then never have to think about again. It's just you think about it when the kid's born and that's it. When in reality, it's a permanent change to someone's body. So that decision is going to affect their future sexuality. It's going to reflect their relationship to their body, their relationship to their gender. It's going to uh, affect future romantic relationships they have. And when you really get into it, it even affects things like law and culture and how we perceive people and religion and these larger institutions. And so what interested me in the subject wasn't just the way that it's typically presented in the media of, you know, what are the pros? What are the cons? Almost this checklist, like you're buying a car or something, but the deeper identity questions of, of like, what are our values and, and what do we think is important about what, what we teach our kids and how we treat them and how does this, you know, how does this relate to gender? How does this relate, how does it affect the psychology of someone later? So when you actually get into the subject, it affects all these identity level questions. And one of the interesting things I'd found when I started working on the film is I would tell people, you know, I was working on a film on circumcision and inevitably some, there's some initial shocked reaction from certain people. But then once they got past the initial shock, they had questions. And the other thing that they had was stories. So people would say, you know, I've never told anyone this, but, or you've probably never heard a story like this, but, and they were telling a lot of the same stories, but because this is sort of a cultural taboo, people didn't realize they were telling the same stories. They didn't realize that they weren't the only one who felt that way and that they weren't the only one who had that thought or that curiosity. So I think this subject is something that actually affects everyone and that everyone should be aware of but it is framed by culture as something sort of obscure because that means you don't question it. Because if it happened when you were an adult, you, you question it, right? Like let's say you woke up tomorrow and half the shaft skin of your penis was missing just the next morning. You would, like, how long would you spend trying to figure out why that had happened, right? <laughs> um, you wouldn't go, well, I don't know, it seems fine. I'm fine with it, you know, and then just move on with your day. You'd <laughs> spend some time trying to understand why this happened. 
And if you talk to a friend and the friend said, oh, well, why are you concerned about that? You would wonder what was wrong with your friend. And if they told you, well, what happened to me when I was a defenseless infant and couldn't do anything about it, you would say, what, like, my God, what happened to you? Like, have you ever talked to anyone about this? But because it exists in culture in a very particular frame, we don't look at it that way. And so what's interesting to me isn't just the subject itself, but the, also the fact that people don't think about it more clearly. And when you do start to think about it, it brings up all those identity level issues. And I think that's the reason people are sometimes afraid to look at it because, you know, what does it mean if this thing happened to me and it wasn't good for me or it took away a part of the experience I might have as a man? Hmm. That's the really scary question and all the feelings that come with that. But the good news is that when you actually go into those feelings and explore it, you know, it's not, it is not as difficult or scary as holding the tension of avoidance, which I think is true of any, any healing process or anything, right? If you, if you actually are willing to feel your feelings, they're not that bad. It's the tension of trying to avoid your feelings. That's the really hard thing. So that's a very long answer as to how people reacted to it. There was a sort of an initial shock and then there was curiosity, and then there was a lot of vulnerability and admission of things that they maybe hadn't told other people. Hmm. You know, it's, it's very interesting, and I can tell that you've put a lot of thought and um, research, and you know, you, all these experiences that you've had have informed you deeply about the issue. Um, but I wonder, too, most of what you just said, you probably didn't have the ability to say when you went into making the film. And I wonder yeah. what, sparked your, what sparked your interest in the first place. I mean, just was there, was there some sort of event or was there some thing that kind of got your gears turning? Yeah. So I think like a lot of people, I, I didn't think about it. And when it, the subject came up, it was just sort of like, well, it's already happened. There's nothing I can do about it now. Um, you know why it makes me kind of uncomfortable there was a, it, it, it didn't feel like something I had any control over so you know why think about it um but i i was part of a meditation group at, when i when i was right before right before i started the the film project and i was going through a period of a lot of self development i was letting go of a lot of old patterns and beliefs that didn't serve me and i had this experience during meditation where I felt this like really cold sensation in the body. And I had just the word circumcision come to my mind, nothing else around it. Um, Cause I'd run across it in this sort of reading I was doing about psychology and the, how things that have happened to you early in life affect you later on. And, and like I said, every time it came up, I was just, I'm going to, you know, I don't know what that is. I'm going to avoid that. But in meditation, you have to be present with whatever's in your body, right? You don't, you know, just, you sit, you watch your thoughts and whatever comes up, you just stay with it. So circumcision as a word just literally entered my mind. And I felt this cold sensation in the body. And it f I felt all my energy drain down to my belt. And it was this really uncomfortable sensation. And I just wondered, like, what, what was that? You know, clearly some part of my consciousness wants me to look at this. And so I went home and I started researching. And... Two of the first things I found were that when the procedure was done, and, and sometimes it's still done this way today, when the procedure was done in the 80s when I was born, they believed that infants did not feel pain and would do the procedure without anesthesia, which you can imagine cutting into a child, a newborn infant's body with no anesthesia. The, a lot of activists have told me that just hearing those screams what made them want to change the issue and want mm. to get people to think differently about circumcision. And I had had a friend who had had a sort of abandonment when she was an infant and still had abandonment issues because of that. And so I thought, okay, well, if just not being held as a child can cause that much later, what is holding a child down and cutting into its genitals? What, what, what must that do? Um, and then the other thing I found was something called foreskin restoration, which is a, a practice where men take the remaining skin that they have if they're circumcised and slowly stretch it over time to get a covering of that part of the body again. And it doesn't bring back all the nerve endings that are removed in circumcision. It doesn't bring back the complex structures of the foreskin, but it does get some of the function and sensation back. 
And so that also made a light bulb go off of, well, I've been told my whole life, there's nothing you can do about this, but clearly there's something you can do about this and something that people are doing. And, and one of my interview subjects, in fact, told me that he estimates that a quarter of a million men are doing foreskin restoration. So, and that, num that number was when I interviewed him, you know, a couple of years ago, it may even be higher now. But both of those things made me think, well, there must be more to this issue than I've been told. And so I became curious and I went through what one of my interview subjects calls the obsessive epiphany, which is when you, you know, you read every book that you can, you, you visit every website you can, you listen to every podcast you can. You've probably gone through an obsessive epiphany on other subjects where you go, wait a minute, there's more to this than I've been told. And you start researching everything. So I went through that and, and uh, that research ended up becoming the film because I was reading all these people's books and then I called them up and said, I'm, I'm doing this documentary. Um, I want to interview you and inevitably they'd say oh yeah and while you're here you know who else you should interview and so I started getting recommended those interview subjects who might have been a, a little less well known but had an interesting story of some kind and that was kind of the genesis of the film. Hmm. That's very interesting um, on, on a number of levels one I find it interesting um, I'm, I'm a web thinker as you clearly are too where um, oh a thing exists well, where else does it exist? Extrapolate, extrapolate, extrapolate. Right. And, and, and then the other thing I find interesting, um, I've had moments in my life where I like to call it a divine calling because that's the mm. way I, I look at things. But there's just been a message, very clear, very obvious. And I've even tried to fight that off from time to time. But I am an obsessive person in a lot of ways. And when something catches it just stays and it's, and then i and then i'm forced to either uh like enter self destruct mode or or pursue the thing um and when you were talking about being in the meditation group and having that circumcision very clear very just right there this is this is something and, and having that physical sensation um you know i've had similar things and i can relate to that and it's i find it interesting that from from that point okay now my mind is kind of latched onto this thing and I'm going to go pursue it a little bit. And then, Oh, you know, this really is something interesting. And then you get into that zone where it's just like consuming. And, mm. and then from there you make a movie. So you read all these books, you have a, you formulate your opinions on the matter. Um, and then you start to go to talk to experts and you start to talk to people who have had these experiences and from the from the place that you started to the place that you ended up by the time the film was completed, what what were the what was kind of the metamorphosis of your thinking on the matter? Um, there's a lot of ways I could answer that. I think when I started, I had the idea that I would just share the information with people, and then they would get it. And what I found is that the information is not enough for most people or more accurately it's not the deciding factor so i even had some people who were reluctant to hear new information just the idea of learning something about this subject was scary for them you know even just saying the word circumcision you can see some people their shoulders tense up and they kind of unconsciously guard their body or their genitals and i just get really curious about like what's that about because when you have a debate or a discussion about any other public issue you know it's not like when you have a conversation about uh immigration or gun control or something like that that people like get scared and like think you're going to hurt them in some way but the body unconsciously responds sometimes when you talk about this issue so i got really curious about that and i got really curious about the psychology of the issue and why it is that people are reluctant to talk about it and reluctant to explore the facts of the issue. Because from a, a factual perspective, the argument that a lot of doctors and midwives and activists and men and women are making about this issue is actually very simple. It's the idea that everyone has the right to their own body and to cut a part of someone's body off without their consent is a violation of their rights. So we shouldn't cut parts of women's bodies off in female circumcision. And we shouldn't cut parts of intersex bodies off. And we shouldn't cut part of men's bodies off. And 
that argument's very simple, but what's interesting and complex is the mental hoops people jump through to avoid hearing that, mm. to, av- to contextualize this particular part of the body and this particular custom as somehow different as if you were talking about cutting off part of someone's ear or the part of their nose. Um, that was the part that I got really curious about. And, and the other interesting thing that happened is because it took me a while to make the film. When I started, that frame and that idea was seen, I think, as a lot more radical than it is now. Mm-hmm. So when I started and I would talk to people who didn't know anything about the subject, they'd say, well, isn't that cleaner or something, right? And now when I talk to people who don't know anything about the subject, their first comment is, oh, that's really controversial. I think I've heard about that. I think I saw some people protesting that. So over the time I've made the film, I've actually noticed not just a shift in the understanding that I've had, but a shift in the larger cultural understanding where I think that now most people intuitively understand the argument that people are making about this issue. And especially to young people, it's not a very radical idea to say that you have the right to your own body and the right to your own sexuality and that other people don't, don't have the right to touch you without your consent. It's not a very controversial idea. Um, And especially in the context of children, of course you can't touch children without their consent. That's, you know, um, or in any context, really. Uh, But again, in this context, there's all these sort of cultural exceptions that people make. So that has been the change that I've seen on the issue. And then for me personally, I think it's been an education on everything you'd ever want to know about human consciousness and human psychology. Hmm. That's pretty cool. Um, that that from the time you started to the to the place we are now, you've you've seen that kind of evolution in in the culture. And frankly, um, as you're talking about it, it's not that surprising to me, given the fact that there's been so many um, sort of doors opened, we'll say, to looking at things a little differently. Um, and maybe I don't want to make that the focus of of, of where we jump into. That can get pretty edgy and. Um, maybe I don't want to go there with this conversation in particular, but so, okay. So from, from what I gather, um, you have a certain stance on the issue. seems uh, that you've, you, you come down on the side of maybe this isn't such a good idea. Um, am I, is that. So the film is it deliberately does not take a side. And what I do in the film is I show both perspectives and let each sort of make their best arguments. And I made a clear choice that I wasn't gonna do any sort of uh, gotcha filmmaking or or you sort of selectively. I I think the arguments that each side make in the film are representative of their best arguments and correspond to, you know, a lot of what people say on camera in the film is things that they've said and papers they've published and academic work and things like that. So I made a very clear choice in the film to keep it a neutral perspective. And, and I, I, it's interesting because I think documentary filmmaking in general has kind of changed towards a more activist slant. When I started, there was a really heavy emphasis on people making very neutral documentaries. And now people sort of see documentaries as more of an op-ed than documentation. But my documentary, I very clearly wanted it to just sort of, this is the perspective. Um, I do obviously have a perspective of my own after working on the issue for, you know, nearly a decade now. I have developed, yes, some thoughts about it myself. <laughs> um, but I, when I talk about the issue, I tend to focus on the information. And I think the reason I do that is, you know, I could give you my perspective, but my perspective is very much based in my own experiences and my own relationship to the issue. And what I want to do is give people the information so that they can feel their own feelings. So I know there's a lot of activists who, when they talk about this issue, they, have a very, they feel a very deep wound around mm-hmm. circumcision. They feel harmed by it. And I think they're completely justified in those feelings. But I also know that if I was to suggest that somehow, you know, you need to feel a certain way, well, I, I don't know. That you, you have the right to your own feelings, right? And I'm more interested in getting anyone listening to feel their own feelings and become curious about those and giving them permission and space to do that. And I sometimes worry if I 
if I land my own perspective on that too strongly, that it will feel like a judgment on their feelings if they ha have something different. So I, my, my process around this issue has been a lot of healing work because I got into it, I became interested in it because I was already doing healing work. I was doing things to let go of old patterns and beliefs that didn't serve me. And it's been a dramatic improvement on my life to go through that process. And I think that this issue too, a lot of people have a fear that if they get into it or they, they become conscious of it, or they research it in some way, that it's gonna result in them feeling bad all the time. P people have that idea about most healing work that they're gonna basically spend all their time being mad at their parents and blaming their parents for all the bad things that happened to them. And my experience of healing work is that you, feel, you do feel those feelings sometimes, but then you release them and you're done feeling them and you can actually have a much lighter, happier experience. And this issue too, I feel much more aware of my body because I've, I've researched this. You know, most men I think have an idea of sexuality, like it feels good on the penis. And they don't realize there's actually different structures to that part of the body, you know, the same way that women have different sensations from the different parts of their body, like the, the clitoral orgasm and the G-spot are two different things. Men can too. But we remove a lot of those parts. And going into the feeling of those parts might involve also becoming aware of the places where there's scar tissue or there's less comfortable sensations. But you can't numb some sensations out without generally numbing most of them out. It's not like you can only feel the good feelings and numb the bad feelings. You know, if you repress feeling, you re oh, it's, it's usually universal in what we know about, you know, healing work in human psychology. So, so my process around this has been doing a lot of personal healing work. And my, my perspective is that I want a world where people don't have to do healing work. I want a world where their, their, their rights and their feelings are respected from an early age and that what we teach children is that it's okay to be who they are. That, was my, that is my personal perspective. And I think that now I'm starting to shift from just documenting the actions of others to potentially putting forth my own thoughts and ideas of my own. So I'm, I'm, and a lot of that is due to the fact that I, while working on the film and working on the issue, I've gotten a lot of messages from people who feel really harmed by circumcision. I've gotten a few from people who said they felt suicidal. And there have been people who've committed suicide over this. There's one story in the BBC recently about someone who had a very severe botch, which is not something most people talk about or know that, that, you know, any surgical procedure can be botched. And so there are people who've had most of the skin removed or part of the head of the penis, or it's the surgery has gone wrong in some way. Um, and so the man in the story had had a botch and he just felt like it was never going to change. And he felt incredibly depressed and he handed his own life because of it. And I've talked to a number of men who felt that way. And I feel like they, what are the challenges they have is there's not a lot of resources for men who feel that way. You know, there's not a lot of healing resources for men in general, but there's especially not a, a lot of resources for men who are, have feelings around this issue. Because when they go to a therapist, most therapists don't know about it. And so they say, well, what do you mean? Like, it's normal. It's fine. Like, why do you feel this way? And most healing work requires you to feel your feelings. And the, the therapist, because of the frame they're coming from, is shutting down the client's feelings and telling them their feelings aren't okay. Hmm. So that's part of the reason why now I think I'm moving from just documenting to being more of an advocate. Um, and the film is still something that very neutrally presents both sides, but uh, the film is not the last thing I'm going to do. I'm starting to explore some other projects now, and so that may involve putting forth some of my own ideas and thoughts. And plus, I've got, you know thinking about something for several years, I've developed a few of those. So it's, I think it's time to start putting them out. So, okay. Let's, let's say that, um, you, let's, let's say that you are a circumcision advocate and, mm. I, and I'm not, and I say, 
people have the right to make decisions about their body. Um, you shouldn't be touching uh, children in a sexual manner. You shouldn't be removing the option for people to do this. And as a quick aside, I actually, um, I have a friend who decided to get circumcised at 16. And when he told me that, I was just like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, well, I just, I, it's just what I wanted to do. I, I'm not really going to get into that with you, bro, but that's, that's, that's interesting. And, and I, you know, I learned later that's not necessarily common, but it's something that people do choose to do. And it's like, well, I mean, you chose. So if, if you chose it, then I, by all means, but okay. So, so back to, back to the scenario here, I, I say, well, you know, people have, people have a right to choose what you do to their body. You shouldn't be touching children. Um, it removes some of the sensations. Uh, there's, there's feelings and things that um, then a, a child is not prepared to deal with and they have to wait until they're mature enough to deal with it. And then maybe they won't ever because they don't have the tools to do that. And then you say, what, what is, so you're what asking is what, what, what people who are pro circumcision, what their argument is and how they would respond. Yeah, yeah exactly. So the, the pro circumcision argument has changed over time in the sense that it used to be that groups that were pro circumcision, like the American Academy of Pediatrics would argue that circumcision was great. It conferred all these health benefits. It was essentially a surgical vaccine. And if you got circumcised, you were protecting yourself against a whole bunch of diseases. And now they don't really make that argument anymore because those studies, there's a lot of holes in them. And they acknowledge that even if all of those studies are true, the benefits are not that compelling. Um, the biggest one they still make the argument on is HIV. So they say that circumcision reduces uh, HIV transmission. And the challenge there is that these the, the statements that they'll make are sort of headline statements. So for me to go into the studies that were done on HIV and circumcision, first of all, they were done in Africa, and you can't translate studies from Africa to America, the HIV, the way that it's transmitted and the entire epidemiology of, of that are com two completely different scenarios. Um, but to go into the statistics of it, you know, they say it was a 60% reduction rate. It's actually closer to like a 1.3% absolute reduction rate. So these are the relative reductions to so the absolute reduction. More men left the study than stayed in it. Uh, the group that was given circumcision was also giving counseling to use condoms and use condoms at a higher rate. So you could argue mm -hmm. that studies are actually a study that shows that condom increased condom usage reduces uh, HIV transmission, which I mean, we kind of know that's true. Um, so, but to get into all that takes time. And the first version in the film of exploring those studies was, was an hour long. So I, I could spend an hour just breaking down those studies, but the headline reduces HIV. You can put that up and immediately move on to the next argument. And it takes a while to break that down. And that's part of the challenge of the, the pro-circumcision side is it's a lot of one-liners like that that don't make a lot of sense when you break them down and are kind of internally contradictory. So they'll say it has these medical benefits, but then they'll also say, well, it looks better, it's cleaner, he should match his father. That's got nothing to do with medicine. Those are cultural things, right? Um, and then you start breaking those down. He should look like his father. Why? Like, did, do you remember comparing body parts with your father? Is this a thing that sons want? I mean, that's sort of absurd. Um, and I think the reason that that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think the reason that that argument or that statement has been memed through the culture is that there's a compulsion on fathers to have their sons look like them because you want your son to share the genetic material that you do, right? You want him to actually be your son. So that statement is almost like a very subtle comment from the doctor like you don't want to be a cuck do you you don't want it to actually not be your child but of course it's your child right if if he looks like you know like th that is not the body part that you need to be comparing so it's it's very weird when you actually like break down those statements but you'll you notice they'll throw out like five or six of them one after the other it's uh it's a debate tactic i've heard called a gish gallop which is when you just throw out a whole bunch of statements that would take a really long time to break down. So if I was to give you the overarching theme of their, their argument, it is this idea of parental choice. You know, that parents make choices for their children all the time. They choose what school to go to. They choose uh, you know, 
how they're going to spend their time, and that this is just another parental choice, and that you the essentially parents have the right to make the decisions about their children. Now, that would be the overarching argument, and it's the one that you see um, sort of most commonly now. The reason that parents make that choice is almost irrelevant in the argument, right? They might make it because of this, these medical reasons, but they also might make it for cultural reasons that have no scientific or medical basis at all. They might make it for religious reasons. There's no peer-reviewed study showing that uh, an ancient deity wants you to cut off part of your genitals. Uh, but you know that's what when you get into each argument, that's you know the medical argument is really contradictory to the religious argument. But the only overarching thing is, well, we get to do what we want to our children. This idea that parents somehow own their children, which um, is a really identity level question, right? Like now we're actually getting to the real question of, well, what do you have the right to do to children and? Who has the right to, to children's bodies? And what values are you teaching your child by making that choice? I mean, even if you accept the frame that it's a parenting decision, what is that decision teaching the child? Uh, one of the, the people who appears in my film talks about how, you know, we teach men and boys that you need to use words and not violence and that it's not okay to hurt someone else. But then in the first experience of their life, we teach them that if you're bigger and stronger than someone else, you get to do what you want to their body. Hmm. Is, that a, is that a lesson that you want to teach men on the first day of their life, in their first shared sexual experience, um, in their relationship to their mother, on which all other relationships are going to be psychologically patterned? Like that's a really deep lesson to teach a child that early. So the overarching argument that you hear from, from people who are pro-circumcision now is this idea of parental choice. And that, that'll take different forms. It might take the form of medicine. It might take the form of culture and it might take the form of religion. But that's sort of the overarching theme is parental choice versus what the, the you know, many of the activists I've talked to are saying of the idea of, human rights and individual choice and personal autonomy. You know, it's very interesting because as I was listening to you earlier, I was thinking about the, the, the correlation between sort of the right to your own body and the, the conversation that's um, centering around abortion and a woman's right to her body. And I was thinking, well, it, it seems to me to be the case that, um, you would be more likely to be uh, anti-circumcision if you were pro-abortion. But then when you framed what you just framed, I, I had, I had another thought. It's like, well, um, you know, what rights, what rights does a child have? And one of those rights begin. And, and I just, I found it interesting that on the one hand I had this inkling and then on, and then deeper into the conversation, I had this other inkling. Okay. On the one hand, there's this issue that's tied to a lot of other issues in, in the public discourse right now, whether it be um, abortion and a woman's rights versus the rights of the fetus, or whether it be um, transgender stuff or, or any of these things. But then on the other hand, you have one of the major points of contention um, for people who maybe are on the opposing side of what has frankly become just an argument rather than a debate at this point. And... I wonder if you saw any of those corollaries as you were making this film and, and how you maybe have used your experience um, understanding circumcision and all the issues surrounding it to frame and develop your opinion about some of these other cultural issues that are front and center right now. So the interesting thing about the intactivist movement, which is the movement against circumcision, the name meaning, you know, intact, they're fighting for the intact body plus activist, intactivist. Um, the interesting thing about that movement is it's really d diverse and there's a lot of people who disagree over other issues working alongside each other. So I've met activists who are pro-life. I've met some who are pro-choice and it's always interesting to me because sometimes people are really surprised to be sharing the same movement and sitting at the same table. And a lot of these groups that are involved are at each other's throats on other issues. So 
I know people involved in the movement who are feminists, and I know some who are men's rights activists. Um, I know some who lean very much to the right and some who lean very much to the left. And I have been invited to speak at events and on podcasts of people of like every spectrum. And I think part of that is because everyone has an interest in children growing up safe and happy and healthy. Mm. Everyone has, you know, human rights is a concern and how we treat children is a concern for every group of people. And there, there isn't really one cultural tribe that owns this issue. And often you're very surprised by, by who, who does come forth to take a stand on it and who does care about it. So I don't know that I could say that there's any one correlation as much as that there's certain correlations with certain groups. So for example, I know there's a lot of people involved in the movement who are very adamantly vegan and involved in animal rights. Um, and they, you know, because they understand if society, uh, th their perspective is, you know, if society regularly mistreats animals, well, the idea that we might regularly mistreat other people in other ways is not a huge shock to them. Um, and there's a really strong group of men's rights activists. There's a really strong group of, um, what you might call like red pill aware men. And there's a really strong group of social justice activists. There's actually like, I, I, I had a friend who was at uh, an Antifa event of all places and brought this issue up and there was like a huge agreement from them. So it's, it's very strange because you have these groups that are completely opposed on other cultural issues and on other political issues who agree on this. And I think part of the challenge is that a lot of them don't realize that this is a thing that you could do activism on. This is a thing you could create change around. And it would actually be very simple if people are willing to commit the time and energy to it the way that they do other cultural issues and other political issues. You know, it, there's a lot of uh, political issues that might require some deep thinking or complex cultural or technological changes whereas this one's actually very simple like just don't cut parts of children off the you know the end that's that's the that's the thing we have to accomplish there's significant cultural forces and institutions that want to continue the practice but the solution as far as changing the issue is actually very simple and one that people could take action on on an individual basis that's interesting one one thing that occurred to me uh, while I was just listening to you talk is maybe circling back to an earlier theme and expanding on it a little bit because, okay, almost everybody agrees that you shouldn't be forcing children to do things. You shouldn't be hurting children. Um, and I wonder, but then the, but then the counter argument is that, um, you know, this is, this is maybe what we think is best and, and it's a parent's right to choose. And, I wonder, as you've as you've gone along, and maybe your own perspective or perspectives you've encountered, does the argument that there's a lot of arguments out there? Let's let's do it this. Way. There's a lot of arguments out there that um, might suggest that it would be okay for you to force somebody else to do something that, whether it be you should think a certain way or you shouldn't think a certain way or you should act a certain way or you shouldn't act a certain way, but from what you're saying, it sounds like more and more people are coming to the realization or the opinion that you shouldn't force a child, a child to go through this. You shouldn't um, place them in a position where they're going to have to deal with this and, and let the cards fall where they may. And wh where does that, where does that opinion end? Like where, where do you encounter the, the limits of that sort of, I don't want to, I don't want to force people to deal with things or I don't want to take away their freedom to deal with things, or I don't want to wound them emotionally, or what are kind of the limits of that? Because as you talked about, okay, there's, there's Antifa people, there's red pill people, there's men's rights, there's feminists, and, and each one of those groups, they have, they have the areas where um, maybe we want maximum freedom on this issue, but then maybe we want maximum control on this, this issue. We want to be able to choose here, but we don't want to be able to choose here. Um, and I wonder kind of what your sense of maybe just generally where people's limits 
are on those things having dealt with all of this? So you're asking about the broader cultural questions about where does personal autonomy end, right? Um, you're asking you're asking the broader the broader philosophical question. I'm yes, and and also maybe what your experiences of of how that varies between the different groups who have all rallied around this issue and 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 why in particular maybe this issue seems to be unifying and maybe what we could pull principles wise from this issue to maybe inform us about how to uh, gather around other issues with with greater cohesion so one of the things that uh, one of my interview subjects, Marilyn Milos, who helped found the organization NoCERC and is, uh, was instrumental in, in founding the intactivist movement, one of the things that she says is that my freedom ends where your body begins. Meaning I have the freedom to do you know, what I want in the world, but I don't have the freedom to cross the barrier of your body and do something to your body. And, and I think circumcision is unique in that it is a permanent alteration. It is not something that you can undo. You know, there's people who've talked about using, for example, regenerative medicine to grow that part of the body back and are doing research around that. But right now it's not something you can undo. And it is something that the research shows causes a significant psychological change. So the, the pain does have a lasting effect in changing behavior that's been studied. Uh, you can look up the Anand and Hickey studies around pain and the Tadio studies around pain if you're interested in that. And it removes the most sensitive, the most nerve-laden part of a man's body. So you can look up the Sorel study and the, what is it? I believe it's the Ridge Band study by John Taylor, if you're curious about that. But that's, you know, that is a very significant change and it's a permanent change. And so if you're asking about the, um, what you might call on the line cases or the fringe cases, I don't know. But this one's very clearly not on the line or on the fringes. This is like the most extreme a change you could make to someone's body without their consent. And I think the challenge for as far as activism isn't just getting people to agree. It's mobilizing those people into meaningful cultural change in action. And part of the challenge that I think the, the movement around this issue has is that many of the people who are drawn to are not first and foremost activists. They're not people who chose media or community organizing or politics as a first calling. They're people who uh, were men and just discovered how this issue had affected them or women who understood what had happened to their partners or people who became mothers and fathers and had to think about this question. Um, and there are a lot of, actually a lot of doctors and midwives and birth professionals who encountered this in their work and didn't want to participate in it or perpetuate it. And so I think the ch challenge is finding a way to organize all of those feelings and those people into meaningful political change. And activism is actually a skill. You know, when you see a protest and there's hundreds of thousands of people there, they didn't get there by accident. Someone formed an organization, they got the email or phone number or contact information for all the people who showed up at that protest. They created an organization and a network to publicize it. And they also decided that protest was the most effective strategy, as opposed to say writing a legislator or donating money towards something or putting pressure on a, a private organization. And so that's another larger question that I think is challenging for this issue is finding a way to create that meaningful change. But the good news is there's a lot of things that people can do on a small level and acting locally. Um, you know, every, every town that you're in has a birth fair or a men's group or something that this information is relevant to and a group of people that you could organize. And even if you just got 
a couple people in your town to get together and meet and see if there's something you could do, I think that, that you will find meaningful change that you can do. And it's something that, you know, I, I wish there were more resources on and there, there are a lot of organizations you could find and join. And I'm, I'm working to make that process easier. But right now, uh, I think the best thing for people to do would be to find others who, who also care about this issue and see if they can bring their talents to it. Hmm. Okay. Um, Hopefully, I don't know that may not have answered the larger philosophical question you were asking. I was kind of, stumbling, kind of stumbling do. around a, you know, a vague, a vague sense of where I was going. So that's, that's great. And, and I was just, I was just going to comment, you know, we've kind of taken it a little bit far out there and maybe reached um, the extent of, of how far we can, we can get to as far as kind of getting out there like that. And I, maybe I want to bring it back more concretely. Now, obviously um, you have the religious overtones to circumcision. Um, I mean, most everybody in the Western world is uh, either read the Old Testament or been exposed to the culture that arose as a, you know, as the course of the Abrahamic religions dominating Western society for so long have brought about. But I wonder, is there a time where circumcision was less practiced by the masses in, in recent times and then it began to escalate? It, it didn't start as it, circumcision did not start as a medical practice in the West until the late 1800s. So mm. prior to that, most of the world did not practice it. All of Christian Europe certainly would not have practiced it. In fact, they still don't practice it in Europe. Circumcision is really only practiced in America and as a, as a secular medicalized routine procedure on infants. It's practiced in Islam and certain African societies and in Judaism. But in Islam, it's done when the child is older. It's done like as a coming of age ritual, usually around when the child is six. Uh, and so most of the history of the West does not involve circumcision. So circumcision began as a medical practice in Victorian England as a cure for masturbation. So the, the mm. Victorians believed that masturbation was the cause of a great many social and moral ills. And if they removed the most sensitive part of the penis, then uh, they would stop this horrible evil. And uh, although they were not successful in stopping <laughs> this horrible evil, they, they did manage to make it a common practice. And, and when hospital birth took off, circumcision was something that the hospitals could charge for. And if you look at birth in early hospitals, birth is really horrific. They would put the mother under, essentially, where she wouldn't remember what happened, but she would be out of her mind, essentially. And uh, under full anesthesia, and, and they would, you know, they often, they, they didn't ask for consent, actually, even for circumcision until the late 80s. Uh, they would just, you know, you sign a form and you go into the hospital that basically says the doctor can do whatever they think is best. And it was a blanket consent form for anything they wanted to do during birth. And uh, it was not a very healthy practice, early birth in hospitals, but it was very well marketed. You know, there was a, there was sort of a smear campaign against midwives at the time. So when hospital birth became standard, that's when circumcision really took off in America. And it was, you know, something that they could charge for. Um, so most of Western history does not involve circumcision. And in fact, a lot of people have the idea that Christianity uh, involves circumcision, which it doesn't. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament is very clear. He, he calls circumcision an abomination and says it's not required for your faith in Christ. That we're, you're, you're saved by your, your faith, your belief in Jesus, that Christ was the last blood sacrifice. You don't need to perform more blood sacrifices because he already died for your sins. And in fact, there's an argument to be made that circumcision is blasphemous blasphemous for Christians, because if you perform a blood sacrifice, you're essentially saying, Christ didn't die for me, I still need to keep the law. Uh, and it was a blood sacrifice in the early Old Testament. It's very clearly represented as that. So the idea that circumcision somehow benefited the person it was being performed on 
wasn't something that arose until the medicalization of circumcision in the, in the late 1800s. And even then, they were very clear that they were harming the child sexually, they were moving sensation, but they framed this as a good thing because they saw sexuality as bad and harmful and too much pleasure uh, was somehow unhealthy. And it wasn't until the, the 60s and 70s and the, the sexual revolution that this idea arose, well, circumcision doesn't affect sexuality at all. And that marketing and argument began when most of the arguments prior, including the medical literature, said exactly the opposite. And it was marketed as the opposite. So it wasn't until later that they, there was this idea that arose, well, you know, it doesn't affect sexuality at all. It's totally fine. Um, and most of the history of circumcision involves the opposite. In fact, if you look at uh, a lot of what rabbis wrote about, for example, um, Moses Maimonides, he said it, well, the purpose of it was to remove sexuality so that the man could contemplate God more. You know, he wouldn't be dis distracted by all this lust. So th the practice of circumcision for most of its history has been very different than the way that it's framed now. Now, people still, when you, when you bring up the subject in a modern context, they'll say, well, what about religious circumcision? I mean, people have the right to practice their religion. Um, and people do have the right to practice their religion, but they don't have the right to practice their religion on other people's bodies. So if you were a Christian, you couldn't tattoo a cross on your child's forehead because he has the right to his own body. Uh, and you're not allowed to do things that might be harmful or permanent to a child in the name of your religion. Even, even for example, um, I think it's Jehovah's Witnesses who, I may be getting this wrong, who they don't do blood transfusions. They see that as a bad thing. And there have been court cases where they ruled that the, the well-being of the child was more important than the parental choice of the parents. They said, we have to give this life-saving treatment to a child. You're, you're not allowed to refuse treatment for your child because of your religion. And we also frame female circumcision the same way. So a, a Muslim person cannot circumcise their daughter for their religious preference or their religious reason. But circumcision for Judaism sort of occupies a different space. And I think a lot of that is because people see the Jewish people as having been unfairly persecuted and the idea of making a law or or enforcing a law that would specifically limit one of their customs is seen as unfair or in some way unfairly targeting them. Hmm. But when you get into it, this, you know, if you were to do that, you would be doing something that would ensure that Jewish children are able to have their human rights respected and keep their full body. So it's a, I understand why people get really scared to talk about that because it is a subject that um, it's very easy for people to take out of context and it's very easy for people to use against you for political purposes. And, and at the same time, it's something that I think people need to talk about. You know, it's, it's another sort of, it brings up that cultural issue of are you willing to talk about difficult subjects that need to be discussed or are you going to make the safe statement that doesn't actually protect people, including it doesn't actually protect Jewish people. So a lot of the people involved in the movement uh, against circumcision are Jewish. Hmm. There, there's actually a, a disproportionate number of Jewish people in the intactivist movement. I think in part because they can openly talk about it. Uh, if a Jewish person questions circumcision or talks about it in a very, public way, it's a little less taboo for them to speak about it in our culture. And they're more aware of it because it is more talked about in their culture. Whereas in the rest of American culture, people are a little afraid to even talk publicly about sexuality, let alone something like circumcision. Sure. You know, one of the, one of the things I keyed into as you were speaking was um, the, the sort of counter argument that, um, you know, you can't, you can't, a parent's choice does not extend to m medical treatments on the one hand, but it does with this one. Um, and, and like you talked about that weird little space uh, and, and maybe the financial incentives and the, and the puritanical incentives that uh, maybe gave rise to it in the United States initially. And then um, you add in the religious component and, and the Jewish component and being a little bit like hesitant to, to even delve into the issue. 
Um, and I find, you know, that's so often the case, especially when it comes to something that's ideologically driven is that your argument will shift principles or play both sides of a principle, depending on whether or not it fits within the narrative that you're trying to put forth. Yeah. I, I wrote an article about this specifically looking at the different medical arguments and, and the arguments that medical organizations are making around vaccines versus circumcision. So there's a d big debate happening around vaccines and a lot of the people who I follow, who are involved in organizations that are active on the circumcision debate, are posting a lot about vaccines now. And what I find really interesting, you know, because there's a large movement that, of people who see vaccines as harmful and don't want to vaccinate their children, and there's a large group of uh, medical organizations that feel like vaccines are so beneficial they should be mandatory. And what I find really interesting is that the argument that medical organizations are making on vaccines is that parental choice doesn't exist. You do not have the right to make decisions that are harmful to your child, and we have the right to mandate that you, you as a parent do certain things if we think it is in the best interests of the child, including they're making this argument specifically to vaccines, right? Parental choice doesn't exist. But then they'll turn around on the circumcision debate and they'll say, Parental choice is the gold standard in ethics. Parents have the right to make all, all sorts of decisions. And in fact, when I interviewed people who were pro-circumcision, they would cite vaccines as one of the choice that parents make. Parents decide whether or not to vaccinate. Um, and now they're saying, on the other hand, that no one has the right to parental choice. And, and on, on circumcision, they'll even make the argument that, that parental choice extends to decisions which could result in the death of your child. So there are children who die due to botched circumcisions who literally bleed out during the procedure. There are children who scream so loud during it that their lungs burst. And there's a very real significant botch rate. And some of those botches aren't recorded because they're not discovered until later, until the man's an adult and he's sexually active. So on the one hand, they're saying parental choice doesn't exist. And on the other, they're saying that it is the ethical standard. It is such an important ethic that it even applies to decisions that could kill the child. And I find that really interesting because obviously those two arguments are not compatible. But doctors make money from vaccines and they make money from circumcisions. So maybe it's the real gold standard, right? The, the one who makes the gold, has the gold, makes the standards. Um, I, I, you know, the, I would never have even thought about the vaccine debate except that I saw that dual narrative playing out. And it's not something I've researched. It's not something I really have any kind of strong opinion on, but it is an incompatible ethical standard between those two. You know, one of the things I say with regularity is that if you have more than one set of rules, you don't have rules. And if, if you don't have rules, then, um, it's pretty clear the things that are governing you and uh, it's usually money and power. <laughs> yeah. <be> I, <laughs> I would add to that that anytime there appears to be a double standard, there's usually one standard that's kept secret. And I think the frame that a lot of medical organizations want to have is that they are the experts. They have the right to decide what you do with your body. They're the ones with the knowledge. Uh, you know, my, your, your Google search does not replace my medical degree, and, which I always, I, I've heard some doctors, even doctors who are pro-circumcision, point out the absurdity of that. Because circumcision, you know, doctors usually get a 20-minute lecture on it in med school. So I always joke that you, your 20-minute your lecture two decades ago does not replace my six years of research and lifetime of lived yeah. experience. <laughs> Um, but the frame that I think that they have is one of expertise and ivory tower. And the change that's happening in the world is the democratization of information. So even academic journals and papers, which previously you would have had to go to a college library to access, you can now search and find online. And they will make the argument that you as a layman do not have the ability to interpret or understand, but that 
you know, that doesn't change the amount of information that's available. And it also, the doctors are not trained in expertise beyond the expertise needed for their medical profession. So they are not experts on philosophy or parenting or ethics or the larger questions this brings up. You know, just because someone showed you how to use a scalpel and cut part of a child off doesn't necessarily mean that you understand what that part does or what the experience of that child is. Uh, one of the places I will be screening the film and speaking later this year is a group called the Association for Pre and Perinatal Psychology. And I find their work really fascinating because it's a, a group of psychologists who are focused just on the experience of children as infants and children in the womb. What is mm. the psychology of that? And they've, they've done a bunch of research on it and they, they uh, have various people they're, they're inviting to speak and explore that topic. You know, I almost feel like they would be the people you would consult if you wanted an expert on what the experience of the child is. And yet when I, when I heard from a friend who was at a, a protest event for a medical conference, he had someone who was a doctor come up to him and say, children don't feel pain. I'm a doctor. You can't argue with me. And it's like, one, obviously they do feel pain. Every study since the 80s indicates that they feel pain. Even pro-circumcision groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics acknowledge that infants feel pain. Uh, but two, why, why would his medical training have anything to do with that? He's, again, he's not trained in psychology. He's not, you know, he hasn't done this, read this literature on that. And it kind of shocks me that people will use the expertise they, they have or the cultural authority they have as a doctor to make claims that have nothing to do with science or medicine. You know, the, the, the idea of, and, and the argument that is being pushed on circumcision now is parental choice which has nothing to do with medicine. It's that the, the argument is that you, the layman, the parent, the person who is completely in shock because you just became a dad or a mother and has no idea what your life is going to be like. Now that this monumental change has occurred, you have the ability to make these choices. So again, there's that weird double standard of like, we're the experts, but you're the parent. So it's up to you. You know, I have three kids and they're daughters, but, um, I have a nephew and I, I talked to my brother-in-law about this because um, just to be frank, I'm, I'm uncircumcised. Um, I know people get weird about talking about it sometimes, but I, I don't care. You know, uh, I can make all the jokes in the world about it, but I'll save it. This is a, this is a more cordial conversation than that. Um, and I said, so, I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Because, you know, obviously it's causing pain to the baby and, and there's these things. And he said, well, to be honest, um, the doctor just kind of said, I, I, I didn't really talk about it. Like I saw that they were going to do it and they, they just did it and then it was done. And I, I didn't really think about it. I'm circumcised. I didn't. And, and I, I just sat back and kind of thought about it. And I didn't want to argue with him about it. It's his son and everything. And um, however I feel he it's, you know, he, he's going to have to, I mean, he's raising his son and, and everything like that. And I didn't, I didn't necessarily want to push on an issue like that because like, you've talked about so much it is a permanent thing and what am I going to make somebody I love feel bad for a thing that they didn't necessarily even think about and then was just done but the point I'm trying to raise is that it's not even really a conversation a lot of times you you might not even you might they might just casually ask I'm going to circumcise you good or, or you know you might even frankly not be asked you know you talked about a carte blanche just I'm going to do this whatever the doctor says, and maybe that's not the case now, but even so, um, my experience knowing people who are parents of sons is it's frankly not even a conversation or something that is presented as an option. It's just, we're going to circumcise now. Yeah. And maybe you say something about it. Maybe you don't. Um, but it's, it would seem to me to be the case that that could be one of the easiest leverage points in making a shift in it is just you have to ask and, and make it an obvious question. Would you like this to be done or not? Yeah. Well, legally they are required now to get a consent form, but they often don't get what's known as informed consent. Um, and I want to come back to that in a moment, but you use the term uncircumcised and I want to update your language a little bit because you wouldn't what? call a, you wouldn't call a woman unmasked. 
hysterectomy, right? If she it. actually has her natural body. So that's part of the reason a lot of the activists involved use the term intact because, you know, you wouldn't say someone, like you're a lot of unthings, like you're probably, you know, unnosed jobbed and un-eye removed and uh, I don't know what the medical term for that is. But, um, you know, you're un a lot of things. So what would you, how would you describe it? Well, whole, natural, intact. Uh, and, and part of what people do with language is they normalize circumcision by describing the norm as circumcised and then the abnormal as uncircumcised, as if circumcision is the default. And we've, it's one of the ways in which I think language really traps people. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's a way, you know, it's, it's a very small change, but it's an important change. Uh, but back to the question of informed consent. Informed consent, you know, any time that you are going to have a medical procedure done, the doctor is expected to give what's known as informed consent. So what would any reasonable person want to know about that? So if you were going in for shoulder surgery, you know, the doctor would tell you, well, I th we're hoping it will do this. There's a potential of this risk. Um, this is what could go wrong. This is what we hope the outcome will be. This is what the recovery time of the surgery will be. You know, anything you'd want to know, right? They'd have a conversation. They'd, they'd answer all the questions. On circumcision, they just say, would you like your child circumcised? And that's it. You know, all the information we've talked about is not presented. All the information in my documentary is not presented. They won't talk about uh, what method they're using or if they're using anesthesia or uh, what the impact of it would be. Um, they won't, you know, there's a, they don't talk often talk about the risk of complication or the fact that mm -hmm. your child, a lot of the parents who've had botches or, or death, you know, the doctor comes back and says there was a complication. They're like, what do you mean? They don't even think of it as a surgery. It's just like this thing you have to get done. People don't even see the child yet as a full person that this is happening to. Uh, so there isn't, you know, the consent part is often obviously challenging because they're not actually getting the consent of the person the surgery is being done on. But there's also no informed part. And I... I you know, a lot of people have tried to change that, to make a shift there. And it's very hard to get someone to understand something that doesn't serve their economic interests. So if the, the hospital said, well, we'd like to do the surgery on your child. Uh, there's a chance that he might die or bleed out through his penis. Like most parents would be like, I'm gonna stop you right there. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we're not doing that, but they would say there's a chance that might happen. Um, you can't use full anesthesia on an infant, so we can only use topical anesthesia, which will numb some of the pain, but probably not all of it because it's not actually that effective. And it's only effective if we wait five minutes and uh, the doctor might be in a rush and not actually wait the full five minutes for anesthesia to take effect, in which case it's like there's no anesthesia. Oh. In most hospitals, it's done by the lowest person on the totem pole. It's often done by med students or interns. So you might have someone operating on your child who's never done the procedure before and is going to permanently alter his sexuality with no prior experience doing that. Uh, even if the procedure is successful, we will have removed the most sensitive nerve endings of his, on his body. There's also a chance that when he's older, he might have feelings about it. He might have feelings of grief. He might actually uh, hate you as a parent for making that decision. There's a chance of that too. We don't know how he's going to feel later. Um, it, and it will probably be really painful. Oh, and there'll be wound care for several weeks afterwards. So he's going to be in pain. You know, the initial anesthesia will wear off and then he's in pain as this wound heals. So the first six weeks of his life are probably going to be pain uh, in his general region. And that's, that's going to be a focus of a lot of your interactions with your infant is wound care and actually uh, applying stuff to that wound. Uh, would you like to have your child circumcised? Right. Uh, you like the, you know, it, rates would drop overnight. So they don't give informed consent because there's, there's not an economic interest in having the conversation that I just had. And there's also a lot of misinformation. So when, when they, the doctor gives informed consent, uh, he hasn't read the most recent medical literature. He might give you what he learned in medical school, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And he'll say, well, uh, I think it reduces the transmission rate of some stuff, but uh, that's pretty much all I know, hmm. you know. So the informed consent's really lacking, and, and there's uh, 
the consent forms are often written in a, in a legal way that really protects the hospital. So if you read the fine print, they do say some of those things. They do say that there's no dotted line on a man's body that says cut here and the results of it could be anything. And you as a parent are basically signing away uh, your legal ability to come after us if we do something wrong. Hmm. And, and just to be clear, uh, in listening to you, I realized I was perhaps a bit like glib about my approach to describing the process that um, say like members of my family went through. I don't mean to say that they went to some like back alley hospital where they didn't have to go through all the normal right, stuff. I didn't think so. The conversation surrounding it is more what I was trying to hint at. And, so, but unfortunately, what you described is like even in the best hospitals, usually how it goes. And in fact, I've heard a lot of stories of people who they have their child in the hospital. They've told the hospital they don't want to circumcise and the child, the hospital asked them like six or seven times. Like, and they're eventually like, no, stop asking, you know, but like that there's an economic interest in making the sale. So one thing, one thing I want to approach here is it's my assumption that let's say the majority of American men are circumcised. Is that, am I, Am I correct? Yeah, the majority are. The infant circumcision rate now is closer to 50% and dropping. Okay. So that is changing very rapidly over time. So the but, reason... But I, the majority of adult men, yes, absolutely. So, so we have a majority of men in the United States right now are circumcised or are circumcised. And, you know, the majority of them aren't going to be listening to this podcast, but the ones who are listening, the chances are they're going to be among the circumcised males in this country. And obviously we've talked about some of the psychological components, although we haven't gone that deep into it. But one of the things that they're going to confront if they listen to this podcast is, well, hey, I'm circumcised. And, and maybe I didn't know all this stuff before. Maybe I hadn't really thought about it that deeply because I've never listened to more than an hour of somebody talking about circumcision. So what... What am I supposed to do with that? You know, and, and, and I'm wondering, because you've dealt with a lot of this, what are some of the steps or ideas or maybe avenues that you would suggest to anybody who listens to this conversation and finds themselves feeling uncomfortable with uh, maybe the feelings or thoughts they're having around the issue? Be with the discomfort. I, I think the most important thing you can do with any feeling that arises is to be present with it without judgment and just feel it. And even, even the feeling of, I don't like what that guy's saying, like, fuck him. Uh, I don't want to hear that. I don't like that. Just be present with that. Um, whatever, you know, all, every healing practice I've ever studied and every meditation practice I've ever studied begins with being present with what is just being present with that feeling and different practices might have you go somewhere different from there, but they all begin with being present with the feeling. And I think the first step of any process or any activity is to be present with what is now, once you're present with it, there's different places you can go from there. You could do various types of healing work to shift that feeling. So the people who I have talked to who've done healing work around this have found that what you might call somatic therapies, therapies that get into the body are really effective and trance-based therapies, therapies that bypass the conscious mind to go into the deep mind. Mm. And I'm working on some stuff that will hopefully make finding healers that people can work with a little bit easier, but I'm not there yet on that. Um, so you can do healing and work around it and shift those feelings. You can also shift things physically. So there are, like I mentioned, there's something called foreskin restoration. Uh, a lot of the men who do that, do that because it just increases sexual sensation. So one of the stories that, that one of the men I interviewed told me, uh, he makes restoration devices, things that people use to stretch that skin. Hmm. And you know, the, the principle is very simple. Like the same way someone puts a gauge in their ear and expands it, you can, just lightly put tension on that skin and it will grow over time. And it's a process that takes a long time. It takes 
um, anywhere between six months and six years, but it's usually multiple years for people because you're, you know, you put a little tension. It's the same principle you use when you build muscle, right? You lift weights in the gym and you, you put tension on the muscles and the muscle grows bigger, right? So you can do the same thing with the remaining skin and the people who've done that report that it increases sexual sensation dramatically. Uh, one story I heard was about a man who uh, literally could not finish in his wife and conceive a child. He had so little sensation and was able to after doing restoration. So uh, I've heard stories of people who start having full body orgasms after they do that. Because the other thing that happens after circumcision is that the head of the head of the penis becomes keratinized, which means it becomes rough and abraded. So, you know, if you work with your hands a lot, you start getting calluses on them, right? That's the skin becoming rough and abraded because it's constantly being used and rubbing against things. And the head of the penis is meant to be an internal organ. It's meant to be covered. It's meant to have the foreskin over it. And when you remove that covering, it starts rubbing and abrading against whatever you're wearing, against the inside of your pants. And over time, it becomes less sensitive because it has to, you know, the same way if you get big calluses on your hands from working with them, there's a little less sensation there. It's a little rougher. Sure. So when you cover that part of the body again, that, that, that keratinization, that callousness goes away and the sensation there increases. And you could, by the way, if you're interested in testing this and you're someone who's circumcised, try covering that part of the body consistently for two to three weeks. Like just wear a condom consistently for that time so that it's always covered. And you may find that that keratinization goes away. Uh, I know one of the people who uh, I talked to about this issue a while ago told me that that's how he got into it is he wanted to, he thought all the stuff that these, you know, people talking about circumcision was saying was ridiculous and he was going to prove them wrong. So he did that experiment and he was like, Oh wow, actually it's really different. Hmm. Um, so you can recover some of the physical sensation at present. Uh, you can't get it all back. There's a group called Forgen that's trying to use regenerative medicine to grow that part of the body back. Uh, they're, they're a startup company that's focused on biotech and they're very specifically interested in looking at that. But, you know, they're doing original research and it could take multiple years for them to accomplish that. So the other thing I've heard from a lot of men who do the physical restoration is that actually physically taking charge of their body in that way shifts their feelings a lot. So they're not powerless mm -hmm. anymore. It's not something that happened that they can't do anything. It is, it's something they can do something about, right? So you can shift the feelings, you can shift your body. And I, I, the third thing I've heard from a lot of people is that doing activism or talking publicly about this issue has been very healing to them because that also changes the feeling of powerlessness, right? If you can talk to someone else and change their situation or make sure it doesn't happen to others. A lot of men have said they find that very empowering. And so creating change around the issue in some way. For, for me, I, I had a lot of grief when I first learned about the issue and my method of working on it was through the film. So I felt like, you know, I've wanted to make films since I was 14. It's something that I was doing professionally before I learned about the issue. And that is the way that I moved the energy that I had. And at present, um, it, I'm in a different place. So I don't, I don't feel about this remotely the same way that I did when I started. And I think that that's important to talk about too, because if you have, when you hear about this issue, feelings coming up, feelings of anger or grief or discomfort or like avoidance, just not wanting to hear about this, just being uncomfortable with it, uh, know that if you stay with those feelings and you move them in some way, they will change. I think anytime there's a negative feeling that arises, there's a fear that it's always going to feel this way because the part of you that feels that often, especially when you're talking about something that's a, a really early feeling that comes from something that happened when you were pre-verbal before you had the context to create a narrative around it or process it. There's sometimes a feeling that, that it's always going to feel this way or that if you go into it, it's going to be endless. And it's actually not. It does require being present with it, uh, you know, without limitation on that. You know, you can't, you can't, you're not really being present with a feeling or a person if you say, all right, you have the right to feel this way, but like, get over it. I got things to do. We need you to change this big emotional feeling in like the next five minutes. We got, you know, 
you have to actually be present with it um, and not put a, a, a limitation on, on what that feeling is allowed to be or how long it's allowed to last. But uh, ironically, that level of acceptance is actually what causes it to change. Hmm. So, yeah, the, the, that's a long bit about the healing work, and it's something that we could probably do a whole film or podcast on, but that's the short version. So, so look, we're about an hour and a half in here, and we've kind of run the gamut from, you know, the genesis of this film and a lot of your personal feelings surrounding the issue and, and a lot of the arguments um, on either side. And, you know, clearly you, you have a bent and um, you've said that your film tries to project or present it as neutrally as possible and to let people sort of make their own conclusions and deal with their own feelings and everything. And I think that's a fair approach. So maybe what I want to know and maybe we can close it out with this is, is a, what do you hope people will take from this conversation and from your film in general, take away with them. And then maybe B, you talked about this journey that you've gone through and, and being present with your feelings, but doing the work to move yourself from here to here by engaging with material and, and making something out of these feelings. And I, and I wonder, so a, what do you want people to take from, the material itself and then b maybe what are one or two things you might suggest to other people about how they might take their own discomfort or their own traumatic issues or their own things that they're dealing with and turn them into something that simultaneously heals them and then serves to enlighten other people so my hope for anyone who sees this or the film is that it gives them permission to be with uncomfortable feelings or sensations they might have around the issue. And that it makes this issue a little less uncomfortable to talk about and actually normal to talk about. It's normal to have feelings about your body. It is normal to have a discussion about how we treat children. These are important issues that everyone should be thinking about. That's my hope is that it makes something like this issue that the way it's framed in the wider culture might seem unsafe, but it's actually the safest place to be is when you're going into your feelings and exploring them. Hmm. And as far as the process to do that, um, there's a lot of different ways a person could go. And I, I did a whole podcast with someone on healing and I just feel like whatever you're drawn to is the two things I, I look at with healing methods is whatever it is you're drawn to, you should trust that. And whatever it is you're really resistant to, you should probably look at that too, because there's usually mm. a, re a reason. Um, but I, I imagine that a lot of the people who listen to your podcast are interested in self-development of some kind. And I feel like healing work is just a normal part of that. I think there's a lot of stigma around looking at the shadow side of things, looking at the feelings or the parts of yourself that you've repressed or made uncomfortable. I notice a lot of self-development material is really focused on the positive. It's all about positive thinking um, and focused on how you get external things, how to get in shape, how to get more money, how to attract more women, things like that. And I think it is just as legitimate to go into how do you let go of the things that don't serve you as much as trying to attract the things that do serve you. And so I recognize that there's going to be a lot of people who feel uncomfortable looking at this topic. And I think that that's a natural reaction. It's natural to want to avoid things that feel harmful to you. But I also feel like if you're willing to go into it, and see whatever feelings are already coming up for you, that that could be just as beneficial as any self-development work you do or any external work to achieve something in the world. And my hope is that a discussion like this and the film that I've made makes it safe for people to do that. I like that. And I know you're not that familiar with me, but longtime listeners of this podcast um, know full well that, uh, 
I've come from a dark place and I had to do a lot of things, including counseling, including sitting down for hours and hours and writing thousands and thousands of pages, literally about all the, all the stuff that I had wrapped up inside of me and had to pull out. And so I just want to make sure that what you just said, I second that completely. There's, there's a lot to be said for developing physical culture, for taking care of your diet, for, um, you know, making yourself into the person who can attract the optimum mate and, and all this kind of stuff that kind of circles around a lot of these development groups. But if you're not dealing with the things that are inside of you that are limiting, your potential will only goes so far. And the thing about having something within you that you haven't dealt with is it doesn't just stay the same. It festers and it attaches itself to other things. And you might find that you have this problem over here and you don't even understand why you have this inclination to do this thing or, or why you have this feeling in this situation. And, and if you never examine that, you never connect it back to where it actually came from and do the work to get it to the point where you can be comfortable, where you can remove the poison out of you and just realize you are who you are. This is your past. Your past is not who you are now and it doesn't have to determine where you are in the future. It impacts it, but it doesn't have to limit it. And so uh, I guess on that note, look, I really, I didn't know what to I didn't know what to make of this. I wasn't sure how this was going to go. I wasn't sure what kind of conversation this was going to be, frankly. And um, I'm, I'm really grateful that you came and talked about this. And it was a great chance for me to maybe gain an understanding of an issue that I didn't have that deep of a knowledge of, or even like I, I've had my own opinions about it and everything, but kind of having this conversation with you has woken me up to a lot more richness and depth surrounding the thing. And, so I want to thank you for taking the time to do this and to enlighten my audience a little bit about something that maybe they haven't ever taken the time to consider in any great depth and, and hopefully they will now and come to some, you know, encounter some growth while they're doing it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Is there, is there anybody you'd like to say hello to or anything you'd like to mention in passing before we go? Uh, if you want to check out the film, circumcisionmovie.com. That's the place to see it. That's the only thing I can think of. Okay. And where can people find you, social media, and, and that kind of stuff? So, brendanmarada.com. And you can find me on almost every social network at bdmarada.com. Um, and I'm going to be putting out some more stuff on this issue. And I'm also going to be broaching into other topics. So like I said, film was my, you know, medium beforehand and there's other things I want to explore with that. Um, I'm at that stage where I'm starting next projects, but they're not quite at the stage where I can talk about them yet. So if you want to see them, they will be there. And I'm also going to try to create some stuff that uh, makes it easier for people to, to get into this issue and to find others who care about the things that they care about. So that's what the future holds, but at BD Murata. Very cool. Well, once again, thank you very much for coming on. This has been the Logos and Trivical podcast. I'm Chance Lunsford. He's Brendan Murata, and we are out. <laughs>